Uh, I'm delighted to have you all here for this very special event today. Uh, my name is Kelly Brownell. I'm the Dean of the Sanders School of Public Policy. I'll make some introductory comments about Ken, uh, and then I'll introduce our provost, Sally Cornby, who will have a few remarks, and then we'll turn the floor over to Ken himself. Uh, you're about to hear a fascinating talk from a leading national and international scholar, Dr. Kenneth Dodd on a topic that touches all our lives. What makes human beings aggressive or good, helpful or unhelpful, or even violent to the point of killing someone, and how can we prevent it? This event is a special occasion to celebrate Ken's remarkable career and accomplishments. But before we get to the presentation, I'd like to give you a little background on Ken. Ken is the William McDougall Professor of Public Policy here at the Sanford School. He is also a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Duke and is the founding director of the Duke Center for Child and Family Policy, which will turn 17 years old this year. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, Ken saw lots of kids who were caught up in the justice system. At first, he wanted to be a juvenile court judge because he thought it would be a very good way to help people. As an undergraduate at Northwestern University, he was a pre-law student but fell in love with science. He applied to law school and graduate school at the same time. Science went out and he came to Duke in 1975 to study psychology. He earned his PhD in clinical psychology, 1978, and served his internship here at the Duke University Medical Center. Since then, Ken has devoted his career to understanding the causes and consequences of violent behavior. He has made profound, influential contributions to the fields of developmental psychopathology, prevention science, and public policy. As one example of his important contributions, Ken developed and tested the major theory of how children learn to process social information. This theory has become the basis for most cognitive behavioral therapies for children around the world today. Ken's published more than 500 scientific articles and papers and has been cited more than 70,000 times. For many scholars, this would be accomplishment enough, but Ken has had a remarkable ability to cross the boundaries between basic science, clinical practice, public policy, and prevention. He has gone, gone above and beyond to apply knowledge, to influence public policy, and improve the lives of young people, families, and communities. As director of the Center for Child and Family Policy, Ken connects people in varied academic disciplines to explore and successfully intervene in problems such as child abuse, delinquency, substance use, school dropout, and early childhood education. Under his direction, the center attracts $7 million a year in research grants, it employs 70 researchers, database analysts, interviewers, and project coordinators has more than 40 affiliated faculty fellows. One of the center's first successes was to establish the North Carolina Education Data Research Center. This highly unique resource was created through a partnership that Ken established with the State Department of Public Instruction, where researchers gained access to vast amounts of data on 1.3 million children and 100,000 teachers in the state's 2,100 public schools. The data center has made possible dozens of studies on topics such as the ideal age to begin middle school, the effects of high quality pre-K programs on later school achievement, and whether bonuses help retain teachers to work in challenging school environments, some of the most important topics of our day. Some 16 years ago, the center produced a report entitled The State of Durham's Children. It identified an alarmingly high rate of child mal maltreatment in the city of Durham. Applying other research findings, the center then developed and tested an intervention called Durham Connects, which provides free nurse home visits to every infant born in Durham County. The program has had remarkable beneficial effects and is expanding statewide and nationally. A perfect example of taking basic research, turning it into programs which then become public policy. Under Ken's leadership, the center is also a place where teaching and mentoring are vitally important. The center oversees the undergraduate certificate program in child and family policy. Through the center's social research partnership, school research partnership, undergraduates conduct valuable studies for local public schools. Ken mentors early career scholars, PhD students, and others. 
His accomplishments have led to a host of honors. These include Distinguished Scientific Award for Early Career Contribution from the American Psychological Association, the Research Scientist Award from the National Institutes of Health, and a variety of other very impressive awards. We're here today to honor Ken for a signal honor that he has received. In October, he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine, uh, formerly known as the Institute of Medicine. The members of this group are an elite group of scholars at the top of their field. I'm very proud to be Ken's colleague and very proud to introduce him for this talk. Now, I'd like to please welcome Duke University Provost Sally Kornblum, herself a member of the National Academy of Medicine, who has a few more words of introduction. So I, I can't be more delighted, uh, couldn't be more delighted than to have the honor of being here with you to uh, continue the introduction and to hear your lecture. So I echo Kelly in acknowledging how very important the impact of Ken's work has been. Um, in today's lecture, Ken will discuss how his research has improved our understanding of the development and prevention of chronic violence in children and adolescents. Understanding these, these psychological mechanisms of aggression has the potential to solve some of the world's most vexing problems among families, social groups, and obviously, as we've seen with world events, uh, between nations. Ken has conducted both laboratory and longitudinal, stu longitudinal studies of how chronic aggressive behavior develops across the lifespan. His work has identified how a combination of biological factors and early family experience lead to a social cognitive pattern that serves as a catalyst for aggressive behavior. This acquired pattern is one of overly defensive response to threatening events. Using this knowledge, Ken and his colleagues have developed and tested a comprehensive intervention to prevent the development of chronic violence in high-risk children. And again, this comes back to, to um, Kelly's comment that learnings in the basic science setting can really be translated for uh, the good of society. Um, the quote, fast-track intervention teaches children to respond to provocation more calmly. It equips them with skills that help them interact successfully with others. A randomized control trial demonstrated that children can learn to, to, to change their defensive responses, and that when they do, they actually experience better outcomes 20 years later. So what are better outcomes? Critical things such as higher overall well-being and happiness, fewer violent arrests, and reduced substance abuse. Ken's research provides a model for understanding why young children may grow up to become aggressive and violent. It provides a framework for intervening in early childhood to prevent the costly consequences of later violence for children and their communities. His work has implications for education policy, family living, and even, as I mentioned, for international relations. Given this scope of impact, it's not at all surprising that Ken was elected to the National Academy of, Med of Medicine. New members are chosen each year based on their accomplishments and contribution to the advancement of the medical sciences, healthcare, and public health. It is one of the highest honors in the field of health and medicine. Ken joins just two other Sanford School professors, Kelly Brownell and Phil Cook, as well as a small contingent at Duke in this distinction. His election to the Academy is a recognition of his extraordinary professional achievement and commitment to service. So really want to congratulate you, Ken, and I, I uh, congratulate him. after the talk. So uh, now please join me in welcoming, welcoming Kent Dodge for his lecture for becoming more benign, competent, and peaceful creatures. Thank you, Sally, for that uh, more than generous and kind introduction. And thank you, Kelly, for your introduction and your support of the time. Thank you, Larry Carmen, for your support over the last couple of years. I, I really am grateful. And thank you all for being here. I'm overwhelmed. I'm going to have a lot of fun. Uh, you might not think it, but I'm going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> Just thank you for coming. Uh, there are folks who have traveled a thousand miles to be here today. Thank you. Um, I'm overwhelmed. With that, let me jump into my um, first slide. And this is <laughs> the most important uh, slide that you'll, you'll see today um, for several reasons. Um, there really have been a terrific number of people who have been good to me um, and have uh, supported me 
These are the names uh, that I could think of. Uh, my memory's fading, so there are certainly many, many more. Uh, the slide's also important for a couple of other reasons. Um, if you get bored uh, over the next hour, or if you like to multitask, um, you can take a look at some of the photos. Uh, most of these photos I took, uh, but some uh, not. But these are photos of uh, the Gustav Wiegland Sculpture Garden in Oslo, Norway. If you've ever been to the home of the Nobel Peace Prize, had an opportunity to see the sculpture garden. It's absolutely uh, captivating, uh, and he has a way of, of capturing the emotions uh, that are involved. And so um, the slides give the um, uh, thesis uh, of uh, my talk today, so you can look at those. Um, and third, uh, the thesis is, is represented uh, on this slide and in the title, in that um, those um, who uh, can see the good in others are more likely to um, be able to behave in competent ways uh, and to respond socially uh, and to be successful. Um, and so with that, uh, let me go to uh, my enduring research question. Uh, this question um, I asked uh, in 1975 when I came to Duke University for graduate school, and I'm still trying to answer the question. Um, how can we prevent children from growing up uh, to kill each other? Uh, the narrative of my talk today begins um, with a master's level project uh, that I initiated in 1975, which is a randomized controlled trial to reduce aggressive behavior problems in Durham school boys. A randomized controlled trial at that time was uh, pretty unique, pretty nifty. Uh, it was a highly successful study uh, showing that the intervention had absolutely no impact. <laughs> And so I stayed away from intervention uh, research for 15 years uh, to try to learn uh, something before jumping back into intervention, uh, to learn how to do become aggressive. Um, and uh, I did learn something about it, uh, while I was interacting with the aggressive boys uh, during that intervention, uh, something about what they do. Uh, in social interaction um, that I think leads to and grows their aggressive behavior problems. Uh, it is a button that gets pushed in social interaction uh, that leads to a variety of psychophysiological, cognitive, mental, and emotional, uh, neuroendocrine processes that I am excited about telling you about today. Uh, I thought I would try to depict the, the process, um, which is really a part of uh, decision-making under uncertainty. You may know there's a rich tradition of research on decision-making under uncertainty. Uh, it has uh, won the Nobel Prize for at least three different psychologists, Herbert Simon, and Dan Kahneman, and Amos Tversky. And um, I've tried to apply some of those ideas uh, to children. Uh, and uh, in thinking about it, though, um, there is a, a common process uh, that I see that maybe you'll see in these three anecdotes. So the first one um, is convinced that Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons. President George W. Bush starts the Iraq War by saying, and this is a quote, after all, this is the guy who tried to kill my dad. That's how the Iraq War started. Second. Um, a 19-year-old mother, this is a mother in South Carolina, and I observed a videotape of her, uh, apparently slapped her six-week-old infant boy after he had, she was changing his diaper and he peed all over her. Um, and she says, I just know he got mad at me for not feeding him quick enough. Six-week-old infant, and these were the attributions she was making about her baby and how she was responding and justifying her aggressive behavior to him. Third, a 17-year-old boy is arrested for shooting a peer. This is a uh, newspaper story uh, years ago in Durham. Um, and when asked why, he said, he dissed me by the way he looked at me. So I think there's a common process of, uh, uh, that I would call defensive processing that involves a variety of uh, steps that I, I want to describe to you. Uh, and so, in, in this talk today, in this time that I have, I'll uh, describe the pattern of decision making under uncertainty that I call defensive processing, uh, its consequences and its antecedents. That's some of the basic descriptive research. I'll apply the findings to an intervention program that we've developed called Fast Track uh, to prevent chronic violence by changing defensive processing in aggressive children. 
Third, I'll apply these findings to another intervention program here in Durham called Durham Connects to prevent child abuse and maltreatment by surrounding a mother with support. And then at the very end, very briefly, um, I'll give some implications for interpersonal behavior, living a longer life, public policy, and, and, and beyond. And then we can grab a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> so the defensive processing style in response to uh, uncertain provocation. Someone comes up to you from behind and bumps into you. Someone says something. Someone looks slightly uh, askew at you. How do you respond? How do you think? Um, We've been taught from cognitive science, uh, those models of decision making and uncertainty, that human beings respond in real time, online, through a sequence of processing steps. Uh, so on the left, I'm going to describe those steps, and then on the right, describe how uh, those steps might lead to or, or uh, be exemplified in a pattern that we call defensive processing. So if something happens, uh, like a bump from behind, the first thing that we do as humans is to attend to that social information. We can't attend to all the information. It's just too overwhelming. I can't attend to every one of you. So I use heuristics. I, I might look at your face rather than your body. I might look at certain kinds of cues to, to inspire interpretations for me. So I'm attending to cues. Well, we have individual differences in, in how we attend to those cues. And some people become hypervigilant to threat. And that's the first step of this defensive processing pattern. You might think about it in the form of a post-traumatic stress disorder individual who is chronically and, and hypervigilant to hearing a sound, or imagine yourself walking down a dark alleyway and how you're going to be hypervigilant to threat. We don't only attend to that threat, we actually interpret those provocation cues in this next step of processing is interpretation of the cues. Uh, we attribute intent to others, we make meaning, this is what we do as social uh, human beings. And so part of the defensive processing pattern is uh, a hostile attribution of bias, a bias toward inferring and attributing hostile intentions to others rather than benign intentions right, in that ambiguous situation. That interpretation, in turn, inspires emotional experiences that have a variety of, of uh, ways of being exemplified. In defensive processing, the emotions are anxiety, fear, and anger, uh, and adoption of self-defense goals um, uh, in a fight or flight kind of uh, response. There are cardiac hyperactivity correlates of that. The heart begins to race. Uh, there are neuroendocrine correlates, uh, testosterone release uh, in males. Um, amygdala activation uh, in the brain. So this is a, a, a network of responses. Now, we don't just experience emotions, we, we respond to social behavior. So the next step of processing is a response generation in which one or more possible behavioral responses is called to mind from memory, right, for possible enactment. It could be aggressive retaliation, it could be crying, it could be uh, walking away, it could be saying something smart-ass wise, it could be a competent kinds of response of engaging others. A lot of different responses are possible. Those that arise first in this defensive processing patterns are ones of aggressive impulses, aggressive retaliation. Now impulsively generating a response is not the same thing as engaging in the behavior. Hopefully all of us have learned a little bit of impulse control, which is the act of withholding that impulse when we evaluate uh, uh, the long-term and immediate consequences of our particular behaviors. And so the next final step of processing is a response evaluation. In the defensive processing pattern, an individual justifies retaliation um, and engages in, in revenge and, and comes to believe that aggression is the proper and appropriate and right and most successful response. So putting those together, you have a defensive processing pattern that I want to talk about. Now, how do we assess those? So a lot of the research that I have done is, is an attempt to assess those processing patterns. Uh, the way we've done it, uh, or among other ways uh, we've done this, is to bring individuals into the laboratory um, and to show them on a screen. Remember when we started out, these are reel-to-reel -reel videotapes in the 1970s <laughs> that we make and we put together and show them on a television screen um, and ask an individual to uh, watch what happens and to imagine being a participant in that video vignette. 
So they're standing there and somebody else comes up and bumps them from behind in an ambiguous way. And we freeze frame it at that point and begin to ask questions of the person. What were they paying attention to? How do they interpret what's going on? What emotions do they feel? How would they possibly respond? How would they evaluate different responses, etc.? Sometimes we hook them up to a, um, a monitor of some sort to assess heart rate. Uh, sometimes we have them spit into a cup. We collect um, uh, testosterone. You, you get the idea. So young kids, we show them cartoons instead of the videos. But it all starts with imagining that another kid comes from behind and bumps you. What we find is not very surprising, but it's uh, overwhelming in its um, persistence and very simple that when an individual, a child, even a four-year-old child, uh, makes a benign attribution in such an ambiguous case, that child is not very likely to then retaliate aggressively. But when that same child makes a hostile <coughs> attribution about the other's intent, given the very same stimulus, that child is very likely to aggressively retaliate, tripling the probability of aggressive behavior. So this tight relation between attributing intent, hostile intent to other, and retaliating aggressively is uh, one that's at the core of this defensive processing pattern. Right? Uh, chronically aggressive children demonstrate chronic defensive processing. So we've done a number of studies in which we identify chronically aggressive children, whether they're in a clinic, psychological clinic, or whether they're nominated by teachers, or observed directly on the playground as who's behaving more aggressively, or rated by their parents, or whatever it might be. We bring them into the lab, compare them to match control peers, and lo and behold, they demonstrate chronic defensive processing patterns in all of these cases. Hypervigilance, hostile attribution of bias, aggressive response generation, aggressive response evaluation. In terms of the psychophysiology, <clears throat> we've got them hooked up and we're measuring uh, heart rate, heart rate changes, maybe second by second. What I've got graphed here are our mean scores for two groups of, of kid, boys, aggressive and non-aggressive boys. And you can see that um, uh, we have them watch the videotape and uh, they're sitting there watching and anticipating. Ten seconds into it, we start rolling the tape. A common human response when you are attending closely to something is that your heart rate goes down as you focus in. And so you see this drop in heart rate for both groups. And then at second number 49, the child is bumped from behind. Right? And you see sharp increases in heart rate in both aggressive and non-aggressive children, but substantially more <coughs> in the aggressive group of children. They respond with higher heart rate reactivity to the identical stimulus compared to non-aggressive groups. Another part of this process of that. All right. Um, not only that, we said sometimes we have them spit uh, into a cup um, while they're watching these uh, provocations or engaging in, in uh, some interaction with others. And so defensive processing of provocation leads to testosterone release. Uh, in aggressive males. So you can see that the testosterone concentration of picograms versus milliliter, or picograms per milliliter, are uh, lower before the provocation, but jump after the provocation. All right, another part of the same pattern. There are also neural mechanisms in defensive processing that I haven't studied, but my colleagues have. Uh, we know the amygdala is activated by watching threatening faces and by perceiving anger in others. Um, we also know that the prefrontal cortex is activated uh, in planning, inhibitory control, control of impulses and, and decision making. We call it a lot of executive function. All right. All right. We've examined this pattern of hostile attributional bias and aggressive behavior worldwide. So ongoing now is a, a study at our center uh, called Parenting Across Cultures that Jennifer Lansford leads, which we are collecting longitudinal data on children in 14 different cultures across the world. Uh, some of them are listed on, on the right there. Far from places like uh, Kenya, Jordan, Italy, Thailand, Colombia, Philippines, and Durham. Uh, and then we find in every one of these cultures this same type relation between um, an attribution and the probability of uh, aggressively retaliating in response to an ambiguous provocation. When a child, uh, these children began when they were eight years old, uh, hundred of them. Um, when they 
made an attribution of a benign uh, intent. They're not likely to retaliate when they make a more hostile attribution. They are more likely to retaliate. Now, these 14 different cultures across the world differ by a lot in their base rates of aggressive behavior problems. Like some cultures have more aggressive behavior problem children than others. And we find that we can actually account for those differences by understanding these patterns of hostile attributional bias. So, culture differences in the tendency to attribute hostile intent account for culture differences in children's aggressive behavior problem rates. All right? So on the left, our graph, the hostile attributional bias score for each culture. On the right is their rate of aggressive behavior problems in that same culture. You can see that the highest uh, group in terms of the same measure of our hostile attributional bias score was children in Kasumu, Kenya, and they also have the highest rate of aggressive behavior problems. Likewise, the lowest rate are children in Trollhot, Sweden, and they have the lowest rate of aggressive behavior problems. All right? So again, tight correlation there. Now, this is all very correlational. It doesn't meet any standard of causal interpretation. You might be thinking, as I am, well, aggressive behavior problems cause children to uh, think uh, in these defensive processing ways, or maybe the defensive processing is just an epiphenomenon that we try to justify what we do after the fact. So to try to move toward causal interpretation, uh, we follow children over time, um, and we find uh, in the Child Development Project, which is a longitudinal study of 585 boys and girls we began when they were four or five years old before they began kindergarten. They're now in their 30s. We're continuing to follow them. Um, and um, Greg Pettit, my colleague in that work, uh, is here today. Thank you for coming, Greg. In that study, we find that defensive processing patterns in childhood, ages 6 to 10, predicts growth in aggressive behavior. Uh, into adulthood, controlling for everything we can control for as well as controlling for prior levels of aggressive behavior. Economists might think about this as a difference is a difference kind of a study. Psychologists using structural equation modeling we get at the same kind of thing. Right. Now, in the fast track study, which is another longitudinal study of 1199 boys and girls followed from age five. They are now 30 years of age, so we've been at it a long time with them. We've tried to uh, look at a broader array of adult outcomes uh, in these same kids, some of whom we've uh, identified as uh, displaying chronic defensive processing patterns and some not. Right? And we predict what happens when they grow up. At age 25, uh, so what I've graphed here actually are five groups of kids. I've just taken this measure of defensive processing and divided them into five groups based on quintiles, the lowest 20%, next 20%, middle next highest and highest 20% on our measure of hostile attributional bias. All right? And then I've got graph um, arrest records, uh, uh, administrative records of arrest for a vile crime. And you can see a fairly linear pattern that as you increase in defensive processing at age 10, the probability of a violent arrest at age 25 goes up in a linear way. All right? Not only do violent convictions go up, but convictions for drug use uh, go up as well. Not in a linear way, it's interesting to try to understand that, but they certainly go up. Property convictions also increase in a linear way. Uh, we had clinicians come and do uh, clinical assessments using psychiatric DSM criteria to uh, diagnose our 25-year-olds as antisocial personality disorder, and we can predict that disorder from age 10. Uh, defensive processing patterns uh, as well. Um, not only that, um, when we look at the parenting that these children engage in when they grow up to be age 25 and assess whether they maltreat their offspring, we find a linear relation, uh, or at least a significant, somewhat linear relation, between the defensive processing patterns they display as a child and their maltreatment of their offspring when they grow up. We look at partner violence for those of whom uh, who, who are engaged in an <coughs> ongoing um, partner relationship, romantic relationship of some sort, and there is again a relation, not linear, but it's that highest group that's at particular risk. We look at other outcomes. Who graduates from high school? 
We can predict who's going to graduate from high school and who's going to be a dropout at age 10 based on this pattern of defensive processing. It's not only an aggressive behavior problem, it's also problems of depression and anxiety that are predicted from this defensive processing pattern. And so we have a relation with clinical measures of depression and anxiety. The last couple, uh, one is uh, full-time employment at age 25. Um, and you can see, again, a relation. The higher the defensive processing at age 10, the less likely you are to be employed at age 25. And last, we have a measure of um, well-being, which is based on personal strengths, happiness, health, and you can see a sharp decline as at age 10, your defensive processing goes up, predicting these outcomes. All right? Yet one more study uh, that I'm delighted Red Williams is here because he mentored me and uh, collaborated with me on a study in the mid-1980s. Um, uh, Red, as you may know, is in the medical center here and has uh, developed the uh, concept of a type A personality and uh, studied hospital and cynical adults. We collaborated on a study of law students uh, from that little piece of down the road, uh, that institution uh, that will go nameless. Uh, it happens that they uh, answered a bunch of questionnaires, including Minnesota Multi Personality Inventory, when they were law students. So we followed them up 30 years, this was in 1955. We followed them up 30 years later, they're now in their mid-80s, their mid or 50s, right? and looked at death records right, of who was still living. Those who had displayed this defensive processing patterns on these questionnaires while they were law students right, are less likely to be living 30 years later. And a nice linear relation. These are quartiles of the hostile defensive processing pattern. So it's the same kind of thing. You might think about, well, what are, how do you explain that? What are the mechanisms? Is it a cardiac problem? Is it uh, something else that's a third variable? Is it that they get into fights and get killed and homicide? Is it they're reckless in their automobiles and are in accidents? Probably all of the above, right? All right. So let me move on. Uh, to the next phase of this research program. I'm, I'm meandering and trying to give you a, a narrative about a program of research. And I apologize if none of these studies is filled with equations or deep enough to give you a deep understanding of it, but it's kind of spraying at you a bunch of different things. So the next question we ask is, well, how does defensive processing develop in dyadic and group interactions? Right? We've tried to answer that question at two different levels. One is in real-time observations of new relationships. So we bring together children who have never met before and a watch on videotape, right? The development of their interactions with others to try to understand the dynamic of that. And then another way is well development across the life, life course by following children you know, from birth onward to see if there are early life experiences that might predict this pattern. So first with the di uh, dynamic observation stuff. These studies, which we began uh, in the early 1980s, um, were laboratory observation studies. As I said, we brought kids together, maybe six boys who are six and seven years old, who have never met each other before they come from different schools. You bring them together into, in the laboratory, have them engage in free play for 45 minutes. We stop them, we take them into different rooms and interview them one at a time, quite separately drive them home, bring them back the next day, they play some more, we interview them. You can see over time, across eight days, across a two week period, we have a lot of observations. These are the only times that they're actually seeing or interacting with each other, right? Because they go to different schools. We have their entire history of interpersonal interaction on tape. And then interviews. And in these interviews, we don't say simply make up uh, a boy who engaged in an ambiguous provocation. We say, imagine that Redford came up to you from behind and bumped into you, right? Or imagine that Kelly came up to you from behind and bumped into you. When you think about that, why, et cetera, et cetera. All right? So by that, we discovered the dynamics of how these uh, defensive processing patterns develop. First of all, hostile attribution of biases toward other children develop within the first 45 minutes. So even after the very first session, we could identify some children who had displayed hostile attribution of bias toward peers and some not. 
right? And they're mutual. So that the children who were most likely to display hostile attributional biases toward others were also the ones for whom others displayed hostile attributional biases toward them and interpreted their behavior as hostile. Right? Because now we've got uh, interviewing me about Redford. Redford's um, uh, a um, peer. I, I can develop a score for uh, the degree to which others attribute hostile attributions. Uh, to Redford. We can see that those are positively correlated, right? They are mutual. And observed aggressive acts follow them from the attribution. So we can predict next day's aggressive behavior based on the attribution patterns that children were making. What I've got graphed here is, is uh, a little bit of that in, uh, in a simple way. So it's the probability of a hostile attribution in response to these ambiguous uh, vignettes. And the red line are aggressive graders. Children who we knew in their schools were aggressive, but now they're interacting with other children and nobody knows their history. They come in and they display hostile attributional biases toward a new group of peers. Right? And they're more likely to do that than our non-aggressive um, uh, children. Um, on the other axis is graph the peers, the target. Right? And children are more likely to attribute hostile intent to an aggressive child than to a non-aggressive child. All right? So these aggressive children who are making hostile attributions toward others are also the buck and the object of hostile attributions by others. Now these children have never met each other before, so this is based entirely on something about the physical being or their social interactions right? within 45 minutes. Furthermore, we learned that defensive processing develops within a dyadic relationship. Yes, there are general patterns, but even more striking are dyadic relationships. So that children develop these hostile attributional biases toward one peer more than toward another peer. Right? And they become uh, stable across time. It's the case that chronically aggressive children have more of these defensive relationships than do not aggressive children. Once initiated, defensive relationships become stable, they're not likely to change, and then defensive processing becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, like a, a vortex over time. Okay. That's the dynamic of it. Um, the longitudinal research, where does this come from in early life? We haven't been successful in uh, identifying genetic patterns uh, that might predict it. Um, we could think about it in terms of, of temperament to some extent, but really it's early life experiences that we've identified. So, in one study, uh, again, this is the Child Development Project, we, uh, in early life, uh, interviewed mothers and fathers about the child's child maltreatment history by one parent or another parent in some way. We identified 11.8% of the sample that we rated as having been physically maltreated in their first five years of life. It seems strikingly high, but it's probably the base rate in our communities. And we compared those maltreated children to match non-maltreated children. And lo and behold, the children who have been maltreated are more likely to display this defensive processing patterns in all of these hypervigilance, hostile attribution bias, aggressive response generation, and aggressive response evaluation. Now, so these children come to be defensive in their processing out of real life experiences. And it makes sense. Imagine being a five-year-old boy in a home, sitting, waiting for your father to come home each night wondering whether that father is going to have alcohol in his breath, is going to be in a bad mood, and is going to get out of his belt and beat you. You're going to develop a defensive processing style, and it's very adaptive. There's nothing maladaptive about it in that particular case. What's maladaptive is these children will generalize. They move to new settings with new adults or new peers, and they display, they bring to it the same defensive processing style with totally new peers for whom it's not working. But they create that reality in the way that they process information and then engage in behavior. And so we find that defensive processing patterns mediate the impact of early maltreatment on adult violence. These kids are at risk for growing up to become violent as adults. All right. Social rejection by peers is another early experience that um, predicts uh, these uh, problems. Um, and so in the same study, um, we have sociometrically interviewed all the classmates 
of our 585 boys and girls, asking them who they like, who they don't like, can we understand and, and learn about measures of social popularity, social preference, and identify some children as being socially rejected in kindergarten, first grade, second grade. That becomes a predictor of the development of defensive processing. So the rejected children show these defensive processing patterns to a greater degree than non-rejected children do. Rejected children are at risk for growing in their aggressive behavior problems, and this defensive processing pattern mediates it. That same kind of pattern in a structural equation line. All right? All right. So we think we've identified this defensive processing style. We've got its components in cognitive, mental, emotional, psychophysiological, neuroendocrine, brain process terms. We know that it places one at risk for a lot of adult problems. We have a little bit of idea about where it comes from in early life. We have some idea in social dynamics about how children recreate it everywhere they go and, and perpetuate and exacerbate these problems. What can we do about it? So in the early 1980s, uh, students and I began a series of laboratory experiments, micro trials, to try to see if we could change it in the laboratory before we dared go out and do intervention again. Right? So we engaged in laboratory experiments. Uh, can we get aggressive kids not to process information defensively? Right? First of all, I can tell you what not to do, some of our failed experiments. <laughs> uh, Direct persuasion. Tell children not to make hostile attributions. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> right? uh, engage in what we might call revengeful punishment. Just punish kids for engaging in aggressive behavior in mean, spiteful ways, which is what we as teachers and parents often do. That doesn't work. All right? But what does seem to show more promise? So in one ex here's one experiment. We, we find that hostile attributional biases can be mitigated at least temporarily in the laboratory, right? I don't mean in the long term, but temporarily in the laboratory. First of all, by helping an aggressive child depersonalize the provocation. So we say, now instead of imagining that this other boy is acting toward you, imagine you, you're an observer and you're watching this boy act toward a third boy, right? When you do that, the differences between aggressive and non-aggressive children largely disappear, and the rates of defensive processing go down. So it's not a general tendency to attribute hostile intent to anybody and everything in the world, even if they're a non-participant observer. It's only in their personalized social interactions. Right? So the graph there is, in the traditional way, when they think about this provocation being directed at, the, at themselves, aggressive children, the red line is a higher probability of hostile attribution than the non-aggressive children. But when we direct them in the laboratory to think about, to take themselves out of the situation and depersonalize it, the differences disappear. So it's one way we might think about it. We've done a series of these experiments, and here's simply a summary of some of what we learned. Helping the children relax before responding. When we said simply relax, calm down, let's, you know, sit and quietly for a period of time before we engage in this task. That reduces the defensive processing. Slowing down. Instead of responding right away, in the laboratory experiment, we said wait 30 seconds before you answer. And that reduces it, not fully, but slightly. Simply reflecting or slowing down makes a difference. Right? Teaching them to attend to all cues. We, we teach them how to recognize emotions in others. Right? It's a skill uh, that five-year-old children sometimes don't have. Right? And that reduces uh, the tendency as well. Teaching children to utilize cues when making an attribution of intent. So what is the intended? Some children base their attribution <coughs> upon the past. Most people are mean to me, so he must be mean to me. Right? We teach them to attend to the actual cues in the here and now. Right? What do you actually see on somebody else's face? And right? teach them to do that, and that reduces the defensive processing. Uh, and finally, making those peers cues. Not only teaching the children, but teaching the peers. If peers' cues are more clear, then children are less defensive uh, and biased in their processing. Right? So anyway, all of these are experiments that, that led us toward an intervention. The intervention is uh, <coughs> captured in um, the stoplight which is a metaphor that we developed. Roger Weisberg actually was the architect of this, 
Um, but, but we utilized them for early adopters of it. Um, and, and so we learned, uh, um, learned how to use it in intervention to teach children to slow down by a stoplight. So literally, we had them to think about whenever they have a problem, somebody's being mean to me, they're not happy, something's not going well, go to the red light. We painted big red circles on the playgrounds at schools, right? And had kids go stand in them. When you want to slow down, count to 10, right? Think about something else, take a deep breath, do all the things we do to slow ourselves down, right? Calm down. Then when you're slowed down, calm down, then you can go over to the yellow circle and think about what was going on. Why did that happen to me? What attributions, what was going on? Also, what can I do differently? How do I feel? How do I think? What will happen if I retaliate aggressively? I might be happier for the moment, but the teacher's gonna get me into trouble, or I might regret it later, or whatever it might be. Teach them problem solving. And then when they have a solution that they're happy with to try out, they go to the red circle on the playground. Green, green. I'm sorry, the green circle. <laughs> go, try your best solution and see if it works. All right, so literally we had the playgrounds painted this way, we laminated little stoplights, put them on the kids' desks, over time, got them to think about it metaphorically in their brain rather than in the concrete reality. But that's the gist of the intervention. All right? We did that with kids, we did that with their mothers, uh, with their fathers, and we did it, and we did it, and we did it. Not for a short period of time, but with the same children for 10 years. Right? We developed classroom curricula so that everybody in the classroom got it. All the teachers were taught how to do it. They got it year after year after year. Right? Big intervention. All right, so that's the fast track study I want to tell you about. Uh, it began in 1990. That's the era of the super predator. Those of you old enough to remember that, when we thought that all our delinquent children were going to grow up to become super predators. It was also an era of pretty healthy NIH funding. <laughs> uh, this study still is going on now, 26 years later, uh, and the federal government's invested over $80 million in this effort. Uh, so what we did was a randomized experiment. We've got 891 highly aggressive kindergartners, four different sites, three different cohorts nationally. A little over two thirds were male, not pre-selected that way. So we had some girls in there as well, about 45% African American, low socioeconomic status mostly because of the schools where we were working in. And then we were randomly assigned them actually by school cluster <coughs> to intervention or control by school so that we could intervene with everybody in the school, the children as well as the peers, right, in the classroom curricula. So the randomization occurred at that school level. And it was a 10-year intervention. It cost $58,000 per child. Incredible amount of money to invest in a child. We followed them up. Uh, at age 25, 85% of them we could still follow and hang on to. And as I said, it's still ongoing, and now we'll be following up age 34. Uh, I won't go through that. That's just the, uh, the uh, equations for uh, modeling the intervention effects taking into account the fact that we have this nested design of children nesting within cluster, within classrooms, within uh, schools. And so we have to account for that by uh, clustering our standard errors, et cetera. Briefly, the intervention. Parent groups, we taught parents how to interact with their kids to teach them these skills and to respond in non-revengeful, non-angry ways, but in, term, but in ways that make rules very clear. This is not a let your child do anything kind of intervention. These are applying specific rules, but in non-angry ways, typically accompanied by uh, rationales. Uh, we engaged in what we call peer coaching. This is a term borrowed from Steve Asher. Uh, and peer coaching kinds of interventions where we have them taught them how to develop dyadic friendships and how to interpret others' behaviors. Uh, we developed what we call friendship groups, which are really social skill, social cognitive skill training groups. Literally, we show faces upon faces upon faces to kids to teach them how to recognize the difference between an angry face and a sad face and an afraid face and a happy face and someone else. Teach them how to recognize those same emotions in themselves. How do you, how do you know if you're mad or you're sad? Some five-year-olds don't know the difference, teach them the words, as well as uh, the actual feelings and facial expressions in themselves and others. We taught it at the classroom level in a uh, curriculum called PATHS, providing alternative thinking strategies. Uh, we also did uh, academic tutoring, which is kind of irrelevant to some of this other stuff, but it was a, uh, a big intervention with a lot going on that seemed to make sense to improve. 
All right, first finding. Random assignment to fast track. Right? Not when they're actually participating, but this is an intent to treat randomized trial. Random assignment to fast track intervention reduces defensive processing by the end of elementary school in all four of these areas. The red bar are the intervention kids, the blue bar are the control kids. These are Z-score standardized scores. So you can see that emotion recognition errors. Right? We came along every summer and assessed children's defensive processing by a team of investigators who didn't know what condition they're in, they're condition blind, they're part of a separate study. They just come in and assess these defensive processing patterns in kids year after year. There's almost a, um, a half a standard deviation difference uh, between the aggressive and non-aggressive kids in their emotion recognition areas. Lower levels of hostile attribution of bias, lower levels of response, aggressive response generation, and aggressive retaliation. So the magnitude of differences are about a quarter to a half a standard deviation. Right? We're pretty gratified. This is what we tried to teach these kids, and we were somewhat successful. Not any miracles being performed, but somewhat successful being able to do that. And we had positive impact in high school on uh, measures of antisocial behavior. So random assignment to fast track reduces anti at age five, reduces antisocial behavior at age 15. Great. Those measures are school records of suspensions, uh, teacher ratings, uh, parent ratings, uh, et cetera, right? Juvenile court records. And the changes in defensive processing that we observed in late elementary schools statistically account for the positive impact on antisocial behavior, supporting our theoretical model. Not proving it, but supporting it, all right? And accounting for about 25% of the intervention effect. Now, not only that, when they were 25, we brought them back into the laboratory and had them engage, uh, had another experiment, had them engage in a computer game where they were playing for points and money against an opponent. The opponent is, of course, a fictitious peer in another room. But they think they're engaging in this competitive game. And in the middle of the game, the opponent steals their points away from them. It's a provocation. I, they're spitting into these cups every several minutes, and so we're measuring their testosterone <laughs> release. Right? And interestingly enough, um, the red line are the intervention kids. The difference between baseline and after the provocation is really not a difference. If anything, they're not releasing testosterone. But those control groups continue to release testosterone after the provocation, and that's a nice significant difference. Furthermore, that difference statistically accounts for age 25 differences in and aggressive behavior outcomes, right? So we think we've got something there. The fast track intervention led to improvements in a number of other life outcomes that have been pretty overwhelming to us in, in how many of them we found. So briefly, what I've got graphed are percentage improvement. So this is the difference between the intervention group and the control group. And I'm just graphing the percentage improvement so they're all in the same direction for the kids randomly assigned to fast track. They have fewer emergency department visits between ages 15 and 25. Fewer healthcare visits uh, that are unscheduled. Right? There's no difference in scheduled healthcare visits. Fewer mental health care visits. Official records from juvenile courts show fewer juvenile arrests. Adult court records show fewer violent arrests, arrests for violent crimes. Um, psychiatric interviews show lower externalizing disorders, antisocial personality. Lower rates of depression and anxiety disorder as well. Lower uh, rates of substance abuse, uh, as we interviewed and, and determined. Um, higher rates of well-being, our measure of satisfaction, happiness, and overall health. And the most recent one, courtesy of John Holbein, this blew me away. He said, maybe they vote more. <laughs> so he looked up their voting records and, and their registration to vote. And sure enough, those randomly assigned at age five for fast track intervention are more likely to vote and be registered to vote at age 25 than are the control kids. So they're more civically engaged and participating. Pretty cool. All right, so now we're engaged with dissemination of fast track uh, in the PATH social emotional learning curriculum. Uh, fast tracks in four countries, the PATH curriculum is all over the place 24 countries, 750 school districts, about 5,000 schools. About 400,000 children a year learn from God's curriculum. All right, so we've, we've been disseminating uh, that. All right, last empirical stuff that I'll come to an end. Can we apply similar concepts to the prevention of child abuse? 
at the population level. We were approached by the Duke Endowment in the year 2000. They wanted to know if we could reduce the child abuse rate for Durham, North Carolina. We said no, <laughs> walked away. <laughs> Leaders at Duke asked us to rethink it, and we've been in a wonderful 16-year relationship with the Duke Endowment Gates and trying to do something about this. So first of all, some descriptive research. Here's a longitudinal study of 500 pregnant women that we did in Durham. These are just a random sample of 500 pregnant women uh, that we assessed in the last term, last trimester of pregnancy. And we asked them to imagine that their baby peed all over them. Right? To imagine that their baby cries. And we asked them to interpret that. Right? So we have a measure of the defensive processing of mothers toward their very own infants. Measured before the baby's born. We go to the Child Protective Services Registry at age 24 months, 27 months later, 24 months of age, who's on the registry for having been investigated for child abuse. And there's a linear relation. So when we take the prenatal uh, attribution bias groups, again, these are quintiles, you can see a nice linear relation. And it's a four-fold increase, five-fold increase, between the lowest group of defensive processing prenatally and the highest group. Uh, in, in the percentage of child abuse registry. All right, so we said, hey, maybe we can develop an intervention. Can't narrowly focus it on that so it becomes a broader, much broader intervention. What we call Durham Connects. I've been very lucky, fortunate to uh, be involved in it with a number of others in the Durham Connects intervention. Robert Murphy's here, Karen O'Donnell, and Goodman, um, uh, Jack Quinn, uh, a number of people who are in this room uh, have been involved in the development of this uh, work over time. So Durham Connects does three things. First of all, we try to connect with every newborn in the community. This is a universal, this is public health population. At one hour after birth, invite ourselves into the home for three to seven contacts, right? Home visits by a public health nurse, in which we frame the parenting task as important, and we communicate that this baby's a positive. Uh, in, in their lives and in Durham's lives, and we celebrate rather than a pain or a burden. And we try to communicate that in intervening. <laughs> we assess their needs. Families' needs are very different. Some are substance abuse, domestic violence, some parenting, some where is simply the best child care service available, etc. We connect them to community resources to meet those needs so that they in turn can connect with their baby. That's the goal of it. It's cheap, $600 a family. We surround them with a available of community resources. We evaluate it with a random control trial. Right? So we randomly assign every Durham resident birth over 18 months to intervention or control. This was by even or odd birth date. If you were born on an even birth date, you're in the intervention group. If you're born on an odd birth date, you're in the control group. That way we can use administrative records to evaluate outcomes with never having bothered that control group for families at all. Right? So that was 4,777 births. We implement the intervention. We did it with pretty good fidelity. About 80% of all births in Durham agreed to participate. 86% of agreeing parents completed the program. Checked fidelity to our intervention protocol. Uh, protocol it was pretty good. We took a small a subsample and conditioned blind to interview them at six months of age. And then we also uh, use administrative record review right, to evaluate outcomes. We replicated it, the second RCT, also in Durham, as well as in a field quasi-experiment with four communities in eastern North Carolina. And lo and behold, what did we find? Random assignment to the Durham Connection Intervention for Mothers reduces emergency medical care episodes. Not only is reported by the mothers, but actually has gotten from the administrative records from Duke Hospital and Duke Regional Hospitals, right? So these are the official records across the first 12 years of life. You can see a, a nice bump difference between the control and Durham Connects families right at one month of age when we're intervening. But then we leave, we're out of the family the first several months. This is not a long-term ongoing program, right? We're long gone. And the uh, two lines continue to diverge so that the effect is larger. So there's a real preventive effect. Right? Cost-benefit analysis shows a pretty good savings uh, to Medicaid. I won't talk about it Last empirical slide. When we go to child abuse registry records, these are the official state records. Who's investigated for child abuse and who's not? We find a 36% reduction in 48 months. So I think we're preventing child abuse in these families. Let's see, continuing to follow them up. All right, 
we're disseminating, we'll go outside of Durham, we can't call it Durham Connects anymore. So we call it Family Connects. So we're disseminating Family Connects nationwide now. Uh, the blue uh, circles are where it's actually being implemented in North Carolina, Iowa, Minnesota. The yellow dots are where we're planning to begin uh, to implement it in other states across the nation. So we're part of all of that effort. And that's a real public health uh, research enterprise because we're trying to study that process in all of those places as well. Last couple of slides and then I'm done. <laughs> Implications for prevention, practice, and public policy. So I think policies and practices that place aggressive children with each other in unstructured settings will only strengthen their defensive processing and aggressive behaviors because that aggressive child or aggressive child dynamic really synergistically leads to the worst kinds of outcomes, right? But that is the major public policy that we have toward aggressive children in this country. That is what we do. In schools, we track them, whether it's by academic ability, which is a proxy for these behavior problems to some extent, right? or the way we suspend them and place them in special education classes for behavior problem kids, or whatever it is. That's what we do in juvenile detention. It's group intervention, after all. And that's what we do in mental health. It's mostly group psychotherapies or group residential treatment programs. Right? We place them with each other. It doesn't seem to work. There were two policies and practices that encourage a child to confirm this hostile worldview that they're rapidly developing when only deep in defensive processing and fail. How do we do that? Interview kids and ask them. Zero tolerance is perceived by children to be a pretty darn <coughs> hostile kind of event directed toward them. And it'll perpetuate and grow defensive processing. School expulsions, rejections from the community, revengeful kinds of uh, uh, responses. And then third, policies that provide consequences for misbehavior while not allowing the child to perpetuate this worldview are more likely to succeed. Right? That's rules with opportunity for regaining status. You screwed up, but you're not permanently a problem. Right? You can regain your status. I think I'm more like this. So. All right, I think there are implications for other domains of daily behavior. Similar processes may operate in other realms of life. We all have our buttons that can be pushed that set us off psychophysiologically into these defensive processing ways. So I think it has the potential to apply to marital relations. <laughs> Pause and think about that. <laughs> Race relations. I, it explains some of the variation, fair variance in um, race, inter-race behavior and race relations, work environments, uh, and even international relations. Right? President Bush was maybe a lot Finally, the general message is to resist the pull to become defensive and process anymore. Resist it, resist it, resist it. Attend to the positive cues, make positive attributions. So I'm going to close with an anecdote. <coughs> antidote to defensive processing, right? True story for those of us who are old enough. In October 1962, the Soviet Union placed nuclear missiles in Cuba and pointed them toward the United States. The world expected a nuclear war to ensue. I remember it. I was hiding under my desk at school, right? Duck and cover. Uh, girls were expected a nuclear war. President John F. Kennedy received two cryptic contradictory messages from Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. <clears throat> On the night of October 26, he got a message stating the Soviet intent to withdraw missiles, just as long as the US privately agreed not to invade. Several hours later, on the morning of the 27th of October, he got another message, more aggressively stating the Soviet intent to launch missiles immediately unless the US publicly and immediately backs down and leaves Cuba and Turkey, which is kind of irrelevant where we were at. Right? What do you do? It's supposed to be a, the red button that you push. You know, it is, was a red button to launch the nuclear bomb, right? the big red button. Audio tapes show that Kennedy wanted to interpret Khrushchev benignly and to declare his own benign intentions. He had two messages. Right? He decided to ignore the second one as if it never happened. And he accepted the first one, right? which in some ways is now old, right? But he accepted the first one, and he wrote a letter of response to the first one. And he wrote to Khrushchev, 
I read your letter of October 26 with great care and welcome your statement of your desire to seek a prompt solution. The United States is very much interested in reducing tensions, and I hope we can quickly agree. And we're still alive today. <laughs> Stop there.